to introduce our speakers tonight, Kathy Patterson. Thank you, Tim. Yes, I, I know um, Paul and Roxy Evans primarily for their Illahi, um, their country club walks usually on the on a Monday when the, the uh, golf course is closed to others and we get the whole, we get the place to ourselves. But um, they've also led field trips at um, into an Ankeny as well. Well, um, Paul started birding back in 1957 um, in the Boston area with his father's encouragement. And then for his, uh, one of his gifts when he was a teenager, got a, his first pair of binoculars and that set him off. And he then uh, joined the army and was commissioned as an officer and then a career in medicine. Um, he's had two overseas tours and 14 different states. So at even that point in Paul's life, he had quite a bird list, I'm sure. <laughs> but since retiring, um, I just have to read you this list because I couldn't, I was in disbelief as well. He's birded like 14 different countries. So he's birded internationally in Kenya and Tanzania, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Germany, England, Italy, the Baltics, Costa Rica, South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and then, of course, now we're going to see a program on the Peru's Upper Amazon. And next month, we will be getting to hear about Ecuador and the Gulf Coast. Now, Roxy started her bird photography in 2017 and is completely self-taught and learning avian wildlife and the photography techniques that go along with that through YouTube, extensive reading, and online classes. And to see your photography and knowing that it's all self-taught, yeah, I think we'll be delighted. Um, she was um, a computer systems consultant and used these skills to really hone her photography skills. So um, Roxy and Paul spend November to April in Palm Desert um, down in California. And Paul leads um, weekly bird field trips to um, Big Morongo Canyon Preserve, and that's a BLM property. And when Bruce and I have stayed in the Palm Springs area, we've gone to that very same preserve and it's the birdiest area around for sure. So thank you for doing that. But as far as Salem Audubon, um, Paul leads a number of trips, probably the ones you just heard about this month, he, will, he probably will be one of the leaders. So it's with my great pleasure I'm going to introduce Paul Evans and his wife, Roxy. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about this particular process. Um, what we're going to do over the next period of time is not give you a big scientific talk about strange endemics and all that kind of stuff, but just kind of show you some of the neat birds that I like that word neat, um, uh, neat birds that we saw on this trip to Peru. And I learned a lot. I had never been to South America. And so uh, we decided to do this trip uh kind of as a pent-up process to recover from the covid problems that we've all kind of gone through here and so we've been traveling a lot lately we're um we decided if we're going to go down to that area we're going to do it right so we started out believe it or not from the galapagos and then went from there to peru to do this trip so we decided to do this one first. Thanks, Tim. No, that's fine. We're, this is Tim Johnson, who is the president of the Salem Audubon Society. He didn't introduce himself, but he's, a, he's the backbone of all the good things that Salem Audubon is doing right now. So I feel 
very honored to have him help me with the technical aspects here. So we'll try to make sure that this is going along okay and then we'll we'll get started. Something else came up. Okay. So anyways, while, while he's doing some of this, um, I'll just kind of go over a little bit of, of what we're going to do today, and I'll rush through the slide um, that's going to explain that. Um, Peru is a fascinating place. And in fact, um, Peru has over 1,800 documented species of birds due to the complex geography of the area. My clicker doesn't work. Okay. Maybe that'll do it. Okay. Yeah, no, this is not in Peru, right? Just, I know you're disappointed, but. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm not sure about you, but it's been a long time since I took geography in the fifth grade. And so I had to go back and look at South America to find out where all these countries were and what was the lay of the land. So as you can see, um, down on the uh, left hand side is the Pacific side. And that little red star that you can see is where we actually were. That's a little bit below the equator. Ecuador is actually right on the equator. And then the Galapagos is 600 miles to the uh, west of that. So that gives you an idea of where this is in the, uh, in the scheme of things. Um, but as you can see, there's a coastline on the Pacific. There's, uh, there are Andes Mountains, and I'll show you that a little bit more uh, further on. Um, we have the Amazon headlands, which are uh, rivers and streams that drain from the Andes itself and go east down into the Amazon River. And I'll show you a map of that a little bit later. Um, there's the Amazon Basin, which is all of this area in Brazil that's um, uh, along all of the waterways that are uh, involved in making the Amazon itself. Lots of forests, there's some savanna, there's punha, there's other areas itself. So what you have is, a lot of different habitats and a lot of different elevations. So that very much encourages birds to come there and various specialists to find a home that's consistent with what their needs are for uh, feeding and, and breeding and so forth. Uh, so we're gonna have a brief overview of the upper Amazon area, show you a little geography and kind of show you how we got to where we were to take all these pictures. We're going to share some of our photos of the birds and the animals and the river scenes that we came uh, in contact with. And then last uh, throughout the talk, we're going to discuss some observations that we made as uh, amateurs about the future of the Amazon basin, uh, what we learned there and the impacts from habitat change and climate change. And it's a lot. to work. Okay, so here's, here's Peru. And if you'll notice, I got a lot of yellow boxes around and these are the areas that are important to our trip. So if you look at the blue box on the right, um, we traveled in April and we traveled from Baltra, which is uh, the airport on South Seymour Island in the Galapagos. So we took a plane from Baltra to Guayanquil, and Guayanquil is a seaside port city in Ecuador, and I'd never heard of it before we decided to go on this trip, but there's three million people there. So it's a very, very busy port, has a big bay and so forth, and we actually stayed um, two days in that area. It's really a nice city. Um, just as an aside, as we were getting ready for the trip, 
uh, the news about two or three months before we were ready to go and we signed up, you know, six, eight months ahead, like you have to do on these tours in order to get a seat. Um, they had a big political uprising and some of you might remember in the news that uh, Peru had all kinds of demonstrations and yeah, no, in Peru, we've been married 35 years and we do this all the time. I don't know how many of you have a long time marriage, but it's funny the way that works, but okay. In Peru, uh, Machu Picchu is an area that a lot of Americans like to go as tourists and uh, the um, political instability in Lima was such that it expanded all the way out to the rest of the country. And the people who were in support of changing the government were blocking all the roads and so the American tourists were actually barricaded from the roads and were stuck in their hotels or whatever for two or three weeks. And so, you know, we're looking at the news with our eyes this big saying, oh, my goodness, you know, this is where we're going. I wonder if we're going to have problems. Well, that kind of resolved itself, thankfully, over the next four to six weeks. But then we're getting ready for the trip. And another news flash comes up from the Ecuador news and Guayanquil, which is where we are flying into, had an earthquake. And so there were reports of all kinds of damages and all these kinds of things. So we're saying, oh boy, we're never gonna go on this trip. Well, finally we got around that and the airport remained open and the hotel was okay. And so, so we made it through. So from Guayanquil, we flew to Lima which is the capital, as you know, of Peru, took another plane to Iquitos, which is uh, in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. And Iquitos is a, um, kind of a big regional uh, city uh, up in that area, and it's the, the big um, metropolitan area of that area. But outside of Iquitos, there's very little. In fact, we had one paved road from Iquitos down to Nauta, which is the place where the marina was for us to get on this boat. And it was an hour's um, bus ride. And it was about maybe a third of the width of this room to get there. And it was, I think it was 40 miles. So, and no other roads anywhere, none. So it was really remote. Uh, so once we got to Nauta, then we got on our, our boat. And so there's Machu Picchu down at the bottom, just to give you an idea. The dark brown area represents the Andes Mountains and they're pretty high mountains. Um, they're kind of the spine of the Western portion of um, Peru itself. But since they're very high when the snow melts, all of that snow melt goes down into the rivers and the streams and whatever and starts this whole process of making this huge Amazon River, which eventually flows out into the Atlantic Ocean. So we went to a place called um, Pacaya Samiria National Reserve, which is a huge national park. It's probably one of the biggest parks, not only in uh, uh, Peru, but in the world. And it, it's 8,000 square miles, which is about as big as the state of New Jersey. So, I mean, that's huge. Um, it's between the two major contributory rivers of the Amazon, the Marañón and the Ucayali rivers. And so that's where we spent most of our time. There were lots of flooded, smaller rivers and creeks and lakes that were part of this waterway system that moved into these rivers and eventually moved down to Nauta and down into the Amazon area. And we went actually at the end of the high water season because I wanted to see all of the, the water as high as it could be to see what was going on there. Um, and that was a lot of fun, but no roads, no bridges, because if you build a road in some of these areas and then all of a sudden there's eight feet of water, that road is not gonna hold up very well. Uh, and so they just don't do it. Everything is by boat. Um, lots of indigenous inhabitants live on the river's edges. Um, here's a kind of a map of where these rivers are. And as you can see, they're tortuous, lots of 
creeks and little rivers going in and out. The Marignan River was the northern uh, tributary. We spent probably two thirds of our time there. The Ukiali River was on the south. Um, this boat on the right lower corner of this slide uh, was our boat and it was, the trip was one through um, National Geographic. And I don't wanna make this a, a commercial message for Nat Geo, but um, that's what we decided to do. And the reason why was they had this process where everything was taken care of for you, which we enjoyed. And then they have uh, naturalists and not only this trip, but the trip to Galapagos had National Geographic educators for photography. And these guys were absolutely superb. And they would actually go with us and help us with camera settings and setting up uh, uh, photography situations and so forth. So, I mean, we went to, to classes at night uh, with these guys. Say again? Yeah, I won't. <laughs> okay. So what, what did this look like? Um, we've done a couple of these talks before and, and a lot of people are interesting to talk because they're saying, hmm, maybe someday I'll want to do this. And if I do, how do we plan that and figure it out? And what are the steps to do all this kind of stuff? And so I'll just give you some basics about our little thing. The top left is was our boat and the, the brown areas were the cabins and it was air conditioned, which is wonderful in the equator area. Um, and then the back area, the white areas were the kind of the common areas. So there were two floors of um, cabins, um, a typical cabin, which happened to be ours, is the one on the bottom left. And so it was very comfortable. It was just beautiful teak wood and just well-maintained and so forth. Um, the uh, middle floor on the white area of the boat was a, a dining room. And so the food was excellent and we had great meals. And, um, it was all local food. So we had a lot of Amazon fish and all kinds of uh, wonderful fresh vegetables and fruits and so forth, uh, which is great. And then the top floor was our classroom and meeting room and places where we all gathered. And uh, they had uh, computer uh, screens and so forth in the top middle of this slide. And we talked about photography, we talked about conservation, we talked about the people and indigenous uh, processes, we talked about threats that, to the environment and so forth that, that uh, the conservationists were worried about. And for those of you that read a lot, you know that the Amazon, in fact, some people call the lungs of the planet because there's so many trees and uh, shrubs and uh, jungle plants and so forth that it's the giant carbon sink of the almost of the entire world. Um, and, and the water that comes up and down through that system, 20% of all of the fresh water in, uh, that goes into the ocean comes from the Amazon. So that's a lot. Uh, so it was exciting to learn about all that. On the top right, you'll notice uh, one, wrong one. Okay, just to give you an idea, we would go out in the morning um, to, in our trips and when we come back, the cabin um, stewards and the maids and so forth would clean up the room and get everything spick and span, but they'd also make these little towel art things. And so we came by, back one time and saw these, these little towel uh, figures coming in and I thought that was kind of cool. These are the skiffs that we came up and these are specially designed for these trips. So if you look at the skiffs, there are two of them. Each one has 12 seats. Um, there were 28 total people on this trip. So it was a very small, very manageable group. Um, but if you notice, there's one row on each side with lots of room in the middle because most people that were on these trips were taking photographs. And if you're getting up, getting down, moving around, you have all your camera gear and everything binoculars, whatever you're using. Um, it's very, very important that you have a little bit of room to be able to maneuver around to get your shots. So those are beautiful. They're um, flat-bottomed aluminum boats. Uh, they had a pilot in the back 
who drove the boat and then a naturalist in the front who looked for um, uh, various animals and birds and plants and all things that we would see. And he would also act as a guide when we went through various uh, tight areas and weeds and stuff to help the pilot get through places where, to go where we wanted to go. Um, we saw lots of different things on the um, edges of the waterways that we looked at. And uh, on the right-hand side at the top, um, since it's a jungle area, there really weren't any roads and paths, but they had a lot of these swinging wooden bridges. How many people have ever walked on a swinging wooden bridge? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, then this, some of these uh, excursions that we went on, there were three or four or five of these in a row. You know, it was a balancing act. So those were there. Um, there were people on the side of the, um, the river that lived on the river and everything was done by boat. So we saw a lot of people um, in the middle slide, there's a, a little boy who's um, uh, getting ready to go to school. And they would take a little skiff with a little small engine on it and take this to a central little area that all the people around in the area went to and they'd have school. Um, and so every, Every day they would go to school and then they would drive back. So we saw them. We also saw on the bottom um, right hand corner some new um, uh, eco lodges that were springing up. And there were people that were actually running tours, uh, civilians who were running mom and pop type of nature tours and stuff for people that wanted to come and see the Amazon. So that, that was fun to see. Um, this other Amazon River sites. Uh, the other thing that we were fascinated about is this juncture between technology and new uh, threats or opportunities, whatever you want to look at it, that's coming to the Amazon and also what the old systems were and all the people who lived on these um, rickety kind of houses, they were all on stilts, they were mostly wood, they had uh, metal corrugated roofs. Um, and then right across the river is a, a beginning a drilling platform for companies searching for oil. So, and if you actually look carefully, there's a big um, electrical tower over on the side for communications, um, telephone, Wi-Fi, whatever they happen to be doing at the, at the time. So fascinating process. This was a slide that Roxy took, which kind of emphasized everything because you got on the bottom left there, I don't know if you can see this or not, you have a little boy who's in a red shirt. Can everyone see that? And his little brother is next door to him and he has no clothes on and he's running around in the water. And then right above him is a satellite dish. So, you know, it's obviously there's some tension back and forth about technology versus tradition in the area. Um, so what we did was we started out at the mouth of um, Nauta, which both of these rivers are coming in to start with the Amazon and everything was very wide. And then we moved into areas that were pretty narrow. And I'm not sure whether this will work or not. Okay, so we got a little, um, a little video there. So we're going from the big channel down into this little creek and our um, nature guide is on the front and all of a sudden we got this big patch of weeds that we're having to get through in order to get to the other area of the, um, of the little river we were going up. And so he's guiding our pilot to go through all these weeds um, they had little cages on the backs of the um, uh, propellers to keep the weeds and everything out. And periodically, he'd have to go forward and then drive backwards to put all the stuff out of the cage and then go forward again and keep going. So he was able to do that. Um, the other piece that was a real challenge for you if you're a photographer is to do um, birding or photography. Let's see if this will work. 
when you're moving. And this is about as fast as we would go on our, on our um, trips. And so, you know, whatever. And thank goodness for the uh, naturalists who had incredible abilities to pick up stuff. And I'll go further down, show you some of the things that they found that even when I was almost right on top of them, I couldn't see what they were finding. And all of a sudden, you know, the aha moment comes up at the steering for, for 10 minutes. Um, so that was really helpful to us as well. Um, there were critters and you had to be careful when you were in the jungle. And I, I kind of captured two of these. The uh, uh, insect on the left is called a bullet ant. Has anyone ever heard of that? You, well, Joseph has, a few people. Well, a bullet ant is a, a, co a relatively common insect in the jungles of the Amazon area. And why do they call it a bullet ant? Anyone know? No, but that's close. Uh, they call it a bullet ant because if it bites you, you feel like you got shot by a bullet. So when I heard that story before I got into the jungle, and I was making sure I was looking around at where my hands were on handrails and whatever, so I wouldn't get bitten by one of these guys because I didn't want to go through that. Um, I wore what I'm wearing now. So, no, uh, just hiking shoes. Yeah, but you, you sh really should have a good thick sole, um, long sleeves, long pants. Uh, yeah, we had some boots in certain areas where it was muddy, but, and we were pretty much fine. Um, if you go in a different time of the year, there's a lot of ants that actually form uh, kind of uh, army ant flocks, so to speak. And they, um, they go through and they eat everything that they can find. And as a birder, you actually go to look for those because there are certain species of birds actually called ant birds that go and they follow these flock these uh, bugs and there's mixed flocks of birds and you can get some great shots of some very interesting birds. Um, can anyone tell me what the, uh, uh, the uh, slide on the right? Yeah, she can see it. Okay, I almost, I almost uh, came up on that, but it's a tarantula and the, uh, the naturalist that came with us actually took them out, let them come in because they're really not poisonous per se, but the little spikes, the hairy spikes that are on top of them, if they get on your skin, they can really irritate you. Um, we also found something called poison dart frogs. And, you know, I never understood how small these were, but as you can see from this slide on the left-hand side, they're almost about as big as your thumbnail, um, but they're very, very um, colorful. And the uh, Indigenous people would um, use them to make a liquid kind of thing and they dip their arrows in them and when they were hunting monkeys or whatever, that poison could be used for um, getting their prey a little easier. But now they're, they're kind of threatened and because of habitat loss, because of pollution, because of all these kinds of things. And so the uh, nat naturalist conservation communities are making these little cups, these green cups with water and nutrients in them, and they put eggs of these frogs in there because the plants that they usually lay their eggs in, their orchids that have kind of water that goes in the bottom of them, um, these are kind of fewer and fewer, and so they're making artificial areas, and apparently these little incubators are working very well. So it's amazing. If you can look at that, it's just a, a plastic cup, and they got a little push pin in it, they stick it on the side of the bark of the trees and, and then they monitor them to make sure they're doing what they need to do. Okay, we saw squirrel monkeys, we saw woolly monkeys all in the treetops running all around. We actually saw something called a pink dolphin, which is a unique for that area of the world. It's a relatively big dolphin. It's bigger than a bottlenose dolphin that some of you might have seen in Florida if you were down there but it has a very long uh, kind of beak and big teeth. 
and uh, they were very curious and friendly. And we actually had one day where we were swimming with these guys and they were just kind of running around us and checking us out to see what we were. And there was all kinds of turtles and other kinds of life that was fun to look at. Okay, let's start now a little bit with birds. And what I like to do when I go on one of these trips is I, I uh, formulate a target bird list. And that bird list usually is about a dozen to two dozen birds. I like them if they look nice. I like them if they're reported in the area. I try to get common birds that are kind of superstar birds because it's just enjoyable to kind of focus your birding a little bit. And one on my list was this plum-throated Cotinga because on the top right, that's what the male looks like, which is spectacular. And so I was just really jazzed when I said, oh boy, I'm gonna see one of these birds. Well, I did, but that's the female and we could never find the male. So, okay, I, I checked the box, but so I put another picture in there just to show you why I was excited about this bird. Um, Roxy picked these up. These are night owl monkeys and they're small tamarind size monkeys. They're the only monkey in the world that hunts at night. And uh, they come out at, at uh, twilight and they uh, eat bugs and little snakes and lizards and all the things that they find at night. And then in the daytime, they come in and hide in these little cavities and trees and stuff. So we kind of disturbed them a little bit and they're checking us out to make sure that we weren't something that was going to eat them. Uh, we saw a lot of kingfishers, and the most common ones are the Amazon kingfisher. And if you'll notice, the Amazon kingfisher looks similar to our belted kingfisher, but I mean, the beaks are much bigger and much uh, stronger looking, and they do a lot of uh, uh, similar uh, activities where um, they're on the side of the, um, the water areas, and then they zoom down and catch fish. And yes, yeah, and the call is different than the, the typical rattle call that we have. Um, but in a sort of in a similar area, you would say, well, it sort of looks, sounds like a kingfisher. And then you go find the bird and there he was. So, um, so I'll have some recommendations for people who are wanting to go to do tropical birding in terms of getting some familiarity and some researches so that if something calls, you can have that. Does, uh, does Merlin uh, recognize these? And actually the answer is yes. Okay, so you set Merlin for where you're going and he actually came up and, and identified some of the songs of these birds. Um, this is a black fronted nun bird and these were calling a lot, but they were really tough to see, but it's kind of a bluish gray bird with that classic orange beak. Um, nice, beautiful bird. Um, we picked up one of these, and this, this bird is a Ferruginous pygmy owl. How many of you have seen the northern pygmy owl here? Okay. So, you know, what, how big is a northern pygmy owl? Yeah, it's like a tennis ball with fluff on it or a softball or something. And that's about the size this guy was. He's a little bit bigger. Um, our guide at 20 miles an hour picked this thing up. And this is just sitting there, not moving but he saw the eyes. And so he picked it up and then we went and got some great photos. This actually was my photo, Roxy got some better ones, but for whatever reason, we couldn't find them. Maybe we'll find them later. Um, this is, we didn't see that many hummingbirds here. And it's, I think it's the time of year because everything was all saturated and flooded and so forth. But this is a black-throated mango, which is probably about a third bigger than our Anna's hummingbird um, and kind of a lot more robust. This is one of my favorite birds, a rufescent tiger heron. And he's a little bit smaller than our great blue heron, but these have a tendency to kind of hang behind and uh, uh, behind branches and that kind of stuff. And they're, hard, they're pretty shy. So we were lucky to get the photograph of this guy. Um, we did see macaws. We saw blue and yellow macaws. We saw scarlet macaw. We saw chestnut uh, chested macaws. Um, and they're beautiful. They, um, they fly, or what we saw is they fly in pairs or small flocks and they go 
in the treetops. Yeah, very high up. So as you can see, this was taken from the bottom up, but still just fantastic, beautiful bird that's wonderful to see in the wild. This is one of my favorite birds that we saw. This is a chestnut-eared aracari. And if you look carefully, you can see he does have a chestnut area in the ear. Um, but I'm absolutely impressed with two things on this bird. Number one, the very vibrant um, red chest. And then these lines that he has on his bill. So, I mean, he's just a spectacular bird. We did see crane hawk which is a, a, a raptor that's kind of bluish gray, has red eyes and uh, you can't hardly see this in this, but he actually has orange feet. So it's a strange looking hawk, but it was fun to see him. Um, we have the brown creeper here in Oregon and that's kind of about it, but down in the tropics, they have just probably two dozen species of wood creepers, wood runners, um, and this guy is a, a wood creeper called a straight build wood creeper. They're, believe it or not, there's actually a curved bill wood creeper down there, which we did not see. And they do the same kind of behavior where they kind of go up into the uh, areas with bark and they kind of look for bugs around the crevices and stuff on the, on the barks. Um, their call's different than our brown creeper, which is a very high squeaky call. These guys had uh, uh, a different call. That's a friend, probably, for most of you. I mean, the uh, snowy egret, this is a, a bird that actually winters down in the Amazon area. And I, I showed this picture because snowy egrets, uh, like egrets all over, what do they eat? They eat fish. But you can tell that this is a different one because of the fish he's eating, and that's a, an Amazon catfish. So, and it, these guys eat just like they do um, in Oregon, where they put their head up and the fish goes down whole and gloat, and they put it into the stomach, and the stomach takes care of the digestive process. But getting around those spines is probably, for me, looks like it's going to be a challenge. So. I didn't see him actually get it all the way down because we were moving elsewhere. This is another <coughs> bird that was interesting. And my, in my background, I actually did uh, research in the Everglades and studied um, alligator ponds. And so I did some bird surveys down there and we had snail kites. And if you look carefully on this guy, and this was a long way away when we got this photograph, you'll notice that he has a very, very long hook on the end of his beak. And the reason why he has that is he eats exclusively snails. And this little insert here is an apple snail, which is what they eat not only in Florida, but in Peru. And they take that beak and they scoop the snail right out of the shell and they can, they can get a meal out, out of it that way. So nice looking bird. Um, we saw a lot of great black hawks. Not only did we see adults, which is on the left, but the juveniles had fledged. Uh, again, this was April, so it was the end of the spring breeding season. And so we saw a number of those birds as well. This was the most common heron we saw, was a striated heron. And he sort of looks like a black crowned night heron. Uh, and he's about the same size, uh, but they were very kind of herony, they were croaking and, you know, complaining all the time when we kind of upset them. And, uh, but to me, beautiful bird. Um, when we got in the skiffs in the morning, we would get everyone in the boat and then we would take off with the motor going. And when the engine moved forward and the boat started speeding across, all of these turns would come and follow the boat. And we were kind of wondering why they were doing that. And the uh, naturalist said, oh, when you skim over the top of the water, you upset all the little big fish that are right on the very top because there's all this water and like that. And so these uh, fish kind of jump away and go down and they have breakfast. So 
fascinating birds. This is a black-capped Donacobius, um, which is what I consider to be a, just a striking bird. Nice yellow eye, a white belly, uh, a little bit of rust on the, on the rump area. And uh, they were relatively common. So Roxy got this shot, and it was great. Um, Roxy got most of these shots. This is a white-winged parrot. And parrots, as you probably know, are very social. And um, this was still in breeding season. And the birds would p frequently pair off and preen each other as a sign of kind of social safety and stability and so forth. And so this is a nice shot of that behavior. Um, I love this bird. This is a greater ani. And these are like gigantic uh, grackles, so to speak. And if you take a look at the bill on this, it's, it's a very funny shape. It's like helmet shaped. Um, there's a greater ani. There's a smooth build ani. There's a rough build ani. Three different types, and they're all in the Central and South American area. OK, this is another bird that was fascinating. So you look at this bird in this photo, which you know is doctored, and you know everything is uh, processed so that you can get the best possible view of this bird. And our nature guide, our naturalist, is standing on this boat going 15 miles an hour or 10 miles an hour or whatever he's doing. And he points over there, and the boat stops and turns around and goes, and he sees this. So who can see where the beak of this bird is? Can anyone see it? Yeah, isn't it hard to see? So these, these are night feeders. This is, these are birds that are nocturnal. And the eye is kind of in the middle at the top, and it's closed. And he's got this little, small, little beak that's sticking out. And, you know, to be able to pick that up, that's just absolutely amazing. I was just stunned. This is one of my favorite birds from this area. This is a horned screamer. And in fact, when they call, it actually sounds like a screamer. But if you look very carefully, um, you will see there's a little white feather that comes off his forehead that looks almost like a unicorn. And these are big birds. This is like as big as like a turkey. And they were, um, they were in the middle of their breeding season and they were um, two or three days we got a chance to see these. So never see that anywhere else. Um, these are white-eared jacamars and they're like a I don't know, like a small kingfisher or a hummingbird on steroids, or these guys are about as a little bit smaller than a starling, and they were all over the place. And they ate um, insects, uh, they ate uh, lizards, and those kinds of things in the trees. And uh, we saw probably hundreds of these. This is a lesser kiskadee, and this is a flycatcher. Uh, we saw lesser kiskadees and greater kiskadees. And if you've been in the Florida area or down in the south, the greater kiskadee is a, a common bird down in the, in the Florida area. Uh, but they were also all over, lots of flies and things that they could eat. This is a black collared hawk. And uh, he's got his collar a little bit in the front. And I think this is a young bird. Uh, some of them had a, a black collar all the way around him but striking hawk because he's got a white head, a black eye, that black throat, and this chestnut back with black uh, primaries uh, coming out. So once you see them, you'll never forget them. This, we saw these guys all over the place. This is a long-nosed bat. And if you look on the slide on the left, you'll see that these bats, instead of hanging down like you know, we've seen here in caves and that there were no caves there. So they would get on tr the bark of trees in the daytime and they would just hang like that. And Roxy got this, this close up on the right. And if you look very carefully, you'll see his nose on the very tip of his head. And this nose kind of goes up like this. And they use that in their echolocation process. And we actually had a night um, skiff ride where we went through with 
uh, big spotlights and stuff. And these guys were all over the place getting mosquitoes and bugs and just pew, right off the top of the water and just amazing flyers. So fun to see them. I'd never seen or heard of this bird before I came here. This is a masked tetyra. And we not only did we find the bird, but we also found the nest. So we had an idea of looking at these guys. They were in a marshy area, um, but you know, a white bird with a, a, a black uh, kind of an edge around their wings and the orange ring around the, the eye makes that just absolutely an amazing bird. We had a couple of birds that looked alike and we had to be very careful in our IDs. Uh, this is an Oriole blackbird and he reminds us of the yellow-headed blackbird that we see in Oregon. But he has yellow that goes all the way down to in his belly and he almost looks, you know, maybe he looks like a hooded Oriole if you've seen those around. And, um, very interesting bird. Uh, there's another um, bird that's similar that's a yellow-headed blackbird from Peru that has a little bit different conformation. And so I had to make sure when we took these pictures that I got the right ID on them. Um, they act pretty much like all blackbirds do. He was a relatively big bird, probably even a little bit bigger than the yellow-headed blackbird. This is uh, probably a premier bird and we could never get super sunny, beautiful light for this bird. But this is a paradise tanager. And he's got a green head. He's got a purple throat. You, if you look carefully on his belly, there's actually a red area, all kinds of colors all over. Uh, just phenomenal bird. Um, lots of tanagers in this area. They weren't as active in high water season as they would be in low water season because of the fact that uh, they um, eat different things. But they were there, and so we had a chance to see them. Um, here's another bird where, you know, the, we're driving along and all of a sudden we say, stop and go look at this. This is a common peruk, and this is like a relative of the nighthawk. And, you know, uh, Barb does uh, a field trip looking at common nighthawks and so forth. And this is in the same family. But this bird is uh, uh, essentially a twilight and night bird that uh, sleeps during the day. And to find this bird, absolutely motionless um, was another example of how good these folks were. This is a plumbius kite. Um, plumbius is from the Latin, which means lead. And, uh, if, for the chemists in the room, uh, what's the chemical symbol of, yeah, of lead is PB. That's from the Latin, which means lead. So that's why they call it Columbia's kite. Um, he's got that classic kite, small bill, uh, relatively short tail. And uh, they were there were a number of these around that we got a chance to see. This is uh, the best we could get for the red capped cardinal. And as a kind of a seasoned bird photographer, Roxy calls this a butt shot. You like to get the bird straight on or even a nice lateral where you can see everything and like a field guide picture. We couldn't get that, but still, this is a, just a beautiful bird. So, yeah, and the eyes too. But if you notice, see, now there, there's somebody who really knows photography. <laughs> we saw these russet-backed oropendulas, and these are big birds, about as big as a, a, a large grackle. Uh, but they made these uh, hanging nests, which to me almost look like Northern Oriole or Baltimore Oriole nests. And these were all over the place. And these were the guys that were making. They're very noisy. Um, I think one of the highlights of our trip, and we, this is very unexpected, was all the woodpeckers that we saw. And this is a lineated woodpecker at a nest that it had, looks like it had taken over for, for somebody. Uh, but he almost he reminds us. Somebody said they saw pileated in your backyard. Almost reminds me of a of a pileated woodpecker. A little bit different pattern on the white and so forth, and his calls a little different. But just a beautiful bird. 
This is a scarlet crowned barbet, and this is sort of like a, uh, a miniature aracari or something. The, the beak is not quite as long, but similar, beautiful um, orange chest and a very defined uh, red crown on them. Uh, this is a very unusual bird, and it was we were lucky to get this. This is a slate-colored hawk. Uh, it's got uh, an orange beak. It's got yellow eye. It's got red feet. And uh, Roxy took this picture way in the distance, but luckily she had a nice zoom lens I could get this image. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of turn it over to Roxy, and she's going to kind of tell a story, um, a... Uh, photographer's story. So the uh, forward button is the one on the right box. Yes, you do. Okay, well, as you can imagine, um, it rained a lot in the Amazon. And so the sky was gray, right? Um, and we did have the two National Geographic photographer instructors with us. And they talked every day during um, the breaks or in the evening. And I took copious notes and I asked a lot of questions and um, one of them is Kike Calvo. Both of them are well published in AP, New York Times, National Geographic, Getty Images. Um, Kike did most of the teaching for us. He answered most of my questions. The other gentleman's name was, um, I just went blank, Dave Katz. And Dave Katz was always in the skiffs with us. And I was always dragging Paul, we got to get in that skiff, because there were four skiffs. And Dave only goes in one of them. And I wanted to be in Dave's skiff. So this day, I was in Dave's skiff. And he always pointed out things. And so he's the one who found the owl monkeys. Anyway, so he grabbed me and he said, and he pointed, you know, obviously you don't want to say too much because you don't want to scare the birds. And I went right on the bird, right? And so this is a spot-breasted woodpecker. And he was pretty active. But right next to him was a dusky-headed parakeet. And that's a limb off that same tree. And just a moment later, I'm just a clicking away, 20 frames a second. I got this. Now, I'm focused, I have to tell you, on the woodpecker. I didn't know I had this till I got back that night and it was looking at my computer and I got to see that. Dave came to me and he said, did you get the photo? And I said, do you mean the one with the two of them? flying? And he said, yes. And I said, oh yeah, it's really good. So he looked at it and he said, we could publish that. And I said, well, that's quite nice. I don't want a job. But he said, I didn't get it. Oh, so that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was her best photo of the entire um, area, and so who knows? Maybe she'll publish it somewhere. Who knows? Yeah, maybe National Geographic will have to say we got an inside track here with some of these people. Okay, so let's move on to the last section of the birds, and then we'll get to the end. This is a wattled jacana, and this guy is a uh, relative of the gallinules that you see down in Florida. And we have a common gallinule that actually comes up as far north as, as Oregon. Um, coots are sort of related to them as well. But the interesting thing about this bird is they've got very, very long tails, uh, toes. Um, and the toes about this long on the bird that's big around as a pigeon. Um, so they, we actually got into an area where these giant lily pads uh, we're growing, and you've probably seen these in books and things. Uh, they're, they're only in the Amazon. And uh, these guys were um, nesting in there. And so we watched them navigate over these lily pads with these big, 
long toes and you know their their total feet area is so wide that they don't sink in they can just walk on water literally so beautiful um, almost purplish brown body and that wattle the red wattle with the um, yellow beak is really amazing to me um, we did get more parrots a lot of parrots it's the amazon um, Roxy got this picture and the thing that I like about the picture, not only can you see the white eye of the white eye parakeet, but the uh, false wing, the Alula, it's got an orange area on it with a little bit of black and then you've got the red, uh, the uh, yellow underwing uh, coloration, which makes it very um, um, striking to me. We did get a, a very unusual bird called a white headed marsh tyrant. And uh, they were actually nesting, and we saw them um, uh, having uh, feeding their babies. So that was a treat. Um, this guy is a yellow rumped sakik, and I'd never seen or known of this family of birds, but they were very, very raucous. They were running around. They were sort of like big grackles, but blue eye, which is striking. They had a. Uh, yellow shoulder patch and a yellow uh, rump, uh, which kind of made them pretty easy to identify when they were flying. Uh, we saw a lot of overhead birds. And uh, what our naturalist said is, you know, this is the Amazon and everyone is trying to eat everyone else. And so, you know, all of the, uh, the bugs, all of the birds, all of the um, bats, everyone, they all had strategies to keep from getting eaten or to set themselves up that they could eat something else. And, you know, it's kind of scary when you think about that, but that's the way nature is. And these guys would fly up all the time. These are yellow-headed caracaras. We, I think this was a pair, but uh, just striking birds. We have in the southern United States caracaras, but we have crested, which is a little bit different than this one. This was my favorite bird. And this is the yellow tufted woodpecker. Um, wow, a woodpecker, it looks like that. But if you look on the left, we actually discovered a nest of these birds. I think this was the last day, wasn't it? And so one of the parents is coming out of the nest and you'll notice you know, this striking yellow a fleshy area around the eye, kind of a little bit of red on the forehead, red on the um, lower abdomen. Um, and this bird is coming out having fed the babies. And the one on the right, if you look, there's all kinds of bugs and grubs and whatever in the, in the beak. And it's just waiting for the, I guess the mom to go out so the dad can come in and go into another uh, feeding session with the babies. Um, so we, we stayed around for a while getting a whole bunch of good photos of these guys. But I mean, amazing, absolutely amazing coloration of these birds. Um, this bird just was absolutely uh, flummoxing to me because I looked at this bird and you look at this photograph to say, okay, Evans, you know, you, you dialed up the saturation because you wanted to impress people with the color of this bird. I did not. This bird is like that in the wild. And it has this silvery beak on the bottom part, the maxilla of the, uh, of the beak. Um, just striking bird. So there's another bird in Costa Rica. Who was going to Costa Rica? There was another bird called a Passerini's tanager, which has a, um, a red rump. But this has the full enchilada. It's just the most brilliant red I've ever seen. Um, this is a capped heron. These are very unusual birds. Uh, and they call it a capped ha heron because he has a black cap and he's got this orange or this yellow area around his face and a yellow neck. Uh, another beautiful bird. Um, got a story to tell you about this bird. Um, this was on my target bird list. It's a Kokoi heron. And, you know, he looks sort of like a great blue heron, but he's got a lot of other features that I think were, were, were beautiful. And he's in, actually in breeding plumage. 
I could never, ever get a shot of this guy except when he was flying away. And so the only two shots I got are on the bottom here. And you can see they're both what Roxy classically calls butt shots because I couldn't get his breast or his head or anything. So I put it up there just to say, yeah, I really did see this bird, but couldn't get a good shot. My other nemesis bird that was on my list was the Hootsin. And this is a bird that's very kind of synonymous with Peru and the Amazon and whatever. And I actually went to eBird before I went. And some people had been reporting them in the area that we were in. And I said, all right, yes, I'm going to see a Hootsin. Never saw. Him. So this is a, an area, uh, a photo that I got from the internet just to show you, yeah, even the best laid plans often go awry and I didn't get one of my target birds, but it's okay. Uh, maybe next time I'll be able to get it. Um, here's the last area that I wanna discuss. When you take photos, a lot of times you're absolutely um, just moment. You got a moment, you see a bird, you take a picture, you don't know what it was and you're just, well, you know, did anyone see that? No, whatever. Okay, so how do you find out about these birds? And the answer is when you do photo processing at the end when you get home. And Roxy took 20,000 pictures uh, over the course of the week that we were there. That's a lot of photos. Now, you got to delete a lot of them because a lot of them aren't worth anything. But we got these birds and we're looking to say, well, is that a spotted woodpecker, spot-breasted woodpecker? No. So we had to do research. And so we went to the Peruvian ornithological research uh, uh, literature on the internet. And we found that these birds are yellow-vented woodpeckers. They've never been seen in uh, this reserve for back to 50 years ago, which is what their records were. So we're probably going to report that to the uh, Peru I don't know, Society or whoever we do. We haven't got there yet to say, well, you know, here it is. And there's the photo. So we're, we're not lying. So interesting bird. We did see animals, too, obviously. This is a three-toed sloth. They were high up on the tree, and they looked like sloths. They were just hanging out, sitting there, not really moving that much. Um, I had a vet tell me, we were talking about that, there was a vet or a vet tech that was in our boat, and she said, they, they move slowly for everything they do, they do, and I said, well, what do you mean like that? He says, well, you know, we studied these in school, and the research on these, you have to go down to the bottom of the tree that they're hanging out with, and sit there for a week before they come down to defecate. And then they would study the, the pellets and whatever to say, okay, what are they eating? Could you do that? I mean, uh, I, mean uh, I might be dedicated, but I don't think I could do that. Yeah, take a book, take, you know, get on your cell phone or whatever. Um, we saw anteaters actually, and they're up in the tree. This is Roxy's best picture. And lots of green iguanas. And this was taken actually right off the boat. Uh, it's fascinating because, you know, every night we finished our area and, okay, we had to stop for the night or we would kind of move out to go to the next area for the next morning. And when we tie, uh, stop for the night, there are no marinas or you know, poles that you tie up the boat on or whatever. And so literally the captain of the ship would drive into the uh, bank area where there are a lot of trees and they would just tie ropes on trees to get, put the boat up. And that's where we stood at night. And so one morning we woke up and this guy was in the trees right outside of the, of the boat area. So we were lucky enough to get a nice shot of him. Okay, I got to show this last one. And uh, Roxy was walking the dog last week. And she comes back with this picture on the left and said, you won't believe what I saw walking the dog. So what is that? Anyone know? 
yeah, it's a peacock. The hell's a peacock doing in Salem, Oregon? You know, he's certainly not on the Audubon checklist that I know of for Marion County. And turns out there was a, a farm that had recently been sold down the street from us. And I guess the birds were out or somebody lost them or whatever. So um, it reminded me of uh, the Forrest Gump movie where um, I paraphrased it and I said, uh, my mom always said birding was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And that's kind of why I like to go birding. You know, it's like a treasure hunt every time you go out. Um, it's an amazing thing. And so I'm, I'm glad I'm a birder. Okay, so that's the end. Um, I got a couple of things to tell you a little bit about. If you're interested more and want to do some research, the best book that I found for a uh, field guide is Birds of Peru by Schulenberg. And uh, it's actually an app that you can get on your phone. And it's almost as good as Sibley. So you can get calls of the birds, you can get maps of where they are in the country, all that kind of stuff. And I think it was like 20 bucks, just like Sibley is. So that's good. Um, Macaulay Library, believe it or not, has all these birds. And if you pull it up and say, okay, you know, I'm going to uh, this preserve, give me the hotspot list over the past five years. It'll pull all these up and each one of the names, you click on the name and it'll give you the photograph, beautiful photographs with descriptions and breeding information and all that kind of stuff. And then some people have asked, okay, well, what kind of cameras are you using? So I put those on too. Roxy uses a, an R5 Canon and uh, has a RF 100 to 500L lens. So it's a very nice system. And obviously her, uh, her photos reflect that. Okay, so um, that's the end of the slideshow.